Hi, everyone, and welcome to PRS Grand Rounds. Thanks very much for your patience. Uh, just hang tight and we'll be starting momentarily. Hi everyone, um, we're going to start in uh, a couple more minutes. We're just waiting for a few more people to join. Thanks very much for hanging tight uh, and give us about two more minutes and we'll get started. Great. Hi, everyone, uh, and welcome to PRS Grand Rounds. Uh, my name is R. Sleevan. I'm one of the PRS resident ambassadors from NYU. Uh, thanks so much for joining us tonight for this award-winning series. Uh, we'll get to our lecture and Q&A for tonight shortly, but beforehand, I'll go over a few quick points. For any plastic surgeons or affiliated specialists, uh, we invite you to join us at the fully digital plastic surgery the meeting. In addition to the great educational networking opportunities, there are also two free panels, uh, including PSF's Volunteers in Plastic Surgery and Surgeons in Humanitarian Alliance for Reconstruction, Research, and Education, or SHARE program. So register for these free webinars and the entire PSTM experience at PlasticSurgeryTheMeeting.com. Uh, with regards to tonight, a reminder that the Classic PRS and PRS Global Open Articles cultivated specifically uh, for this lecture are available for free on prsjournal.com and prsglobalopen.com. Uh, we want to thank all of you, um, especially for helping us win several national awards by being a part of these events. Um, and again, similarly, all the prior lectures and PRS Grand Rounds Q and A's can be found on both of the journal's websites. Uh, and finally, uh, please ask questions in the Facebook's comments section. Uh, you can do that both during uh, and after the lecture, and we'll get to as many as we can during the Q&A session. Uh, we do ask that you keep your comments as short as possible. There's no need for intro or concluding phrases, just so that we can fit everything on the screen for all our viewers to see. 
So tonight, uh, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Rachel Blubon Langner. Uh, Dr. Blubon Langner completed her training at the Johns Hopkins University and went on to do a craniomaxillofacial fellowship at the Hospital General de Manuel Gonzalez. Uh, she currently is the Laura and Isaac Perlmutter uh, Professor of Reconstructive Plastic Surgery in the Hans Jörg Wies Department of Plastic Surgery at NYU Langone Health, and also an Associate Professor in the Department of Urology. Dr. Bubon Langner specializes in gender affirming procedures and care. And tonight, she's going to be talking to us about tips and tricks in gender affirming mastectomy. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for a discussion about chest masculinization in transgender and gender non binary individuals. There is an increased demand for chest masculinization, and while this is a straightforward operation, I hope to share with you some of the things that I've learned and ways in which I've improved my results over time. Just a few preoperative considerations. Uh, testosterone is not a requirement for chest surgery. Um, with regard to screening mammography, I follow cisgender guidelines and do get a mammogram in individuals over 40 or according to personal and family history. I follow the WPATH uh, guidelines and only one mental health letter is required. A hormone letter can be helpful for insurance purposes if the patient is on hormones. I no longer stop testosterone prior to surgery. When I submit to insurance, I pre-authorize both the nipple and the mastectomy. It's important to know that some insurances don't cover the nipple. I think that this is an incredibly effective operation and uh, can be done safely and effectively in individuals under 18 if properly selected and adequately supported. There are many techniques described for chest masculinization, but in my hands, I find that there are two techniques which afford reproducible and consistent results. Uh, the periareolar, and there are two versions of this. One is the inferior crescent, where there's a single incision just below the areola from the three o'clock to the nine o'clock position. Or the concentric circle periareolar, in which the superior portion of the outer circle is deepithelialized, and this allows for removal of skin and reduction of the size of the areola. The double incision free nipple graft is by far the workhorse and the most common um, technique that I use. And I find that the Fisher grading technique helps me select together with the patient the best technique based on the patient's anatomy. So in the Fisher grade one patient, there is minimal breast tissue, there's no skin redundancy, and these patients do really well with a periareolar inferior crescent technique. The grade 2A patient has a bit more breast tissue, but still no skin redundancy, and the nipple areolar complex is on the pec muscle. These patients also do quite well with a periareolar technique. The 2B patient, or what I would call the borderline patient, is by far more challenging. This individual has moderate breast tissue, but the important thing is that there's marked skin redundancy. And I think it's important that while you can try a periareolar technique, you need to counsel the patient for the higher need of, for revision. And in my hands, this approach is 30%. So many of these individuals um, do not want a revision and they are accepting of the scars and they therefore select the double incision and free nipple graft. The grade three patient is the most common patient that we see with marked skin um, redundancy as well as significant breast tissue and a double incision with free nipple graft will give a nice flat chest. The grade four patient is the hallmark of the individual who has been on testosterone for a long period of time and has been binding. There is atrophy of the breast tissue, but there's still marked skin redundancy. You can almost see the highlight of the pectoralis muscle through the skin. And these patients um, obviously need a double incision with free nipple graft. There are many described techniques. There's the um, anchor, there is the fish mouth, there is the lollipop, um, there is the buttonhole. All of these leave a dermal glandular pedicle, and theoretically there may be increased sensation, although because the nipple is left on a dermal glandular pedicle, significant breast tissue is left behind, and I often see that there's a bulge at the pectoralis muscle shadow. I want to share with you a video um, that will highlight uh, the technique.
The superior incision is marked straight across the breast at the level of the inferior border of the pectoralis muscle while pulling the breast down. It then angles up towards the axilla, hugging the lateral border of the pectoralis. Medially, the incision stops two centimeters from the midline and the corner is angled slightly upward. A picture with a grid is used to assist in confirming that the incisions are straight and symmetric. In the operating room, the nipples are marked with a 2.2 centimeter cookie cutter and removed as full thickness grafts and set on the back table. The superior flap is raised first. Dissection is carried out in the plane between the subcutaneous fat and the breast capsule. The assistant pulls down on the breast with a flat open palm while the surgeon's non-dominant hand creates counter tension holding the flap in their fingers. Dissection is carried up towards the clavicle until the pectoralis fascia is reached. It is important to include all of the axillary tail as this can lead to undesired fullness postoperatively. The breast parenchyma is then dissected off the pectoralis fascia in the loose areolar plane. The plane is carried out caudally past the inferior insertion of the pectoralis muscle. Care is taken to preserve as much pectoralis fascia as possible to decrease postoperative seroma, bleeding, and pain. At this point, the breast parenchyma remains attached to the inferior flap, and the incision of the lower flap is marked by laying the dissected breast on the chest under upward tension. This places the incision at the level of the lower border of the pectoralis muscle, not the inframammary fold. The inferior flap is raised in the same plane between the subcutaneous fat and the breast capsule. The inferior flap is undermined caudally to obliterate the inframammary fold. This completes the mastectomy and the same steps are repeated on the contralateral side. Bilateral mastectomy flaps are then inspected and any irregularities in thickness are addressed. The incisions are then tack closed with staples. The patient is brought up into the seated position with arms adducted to the side. The incisions are adjusted to follow the border of the pectoralis muscle. Nipples are placed on the axis of the deltoid pectoral groove and approximately 2.5 to 3 centimeters from the lateral border of the pectoralis muscle and one centimeter above the incision. Suture foil is used as a nipple marker. A picture with a grid is then used to assist in confirming adequate location and symmetry of the nipples and confirm that the incisions are straight and symmetric. Any adjustments can then be made. The confirmed nipple position is delineated with a 2.2 centimeter cookie cutter on the superior flap and deepothelialized bilaterally. Drains are placed bilaterally, coming out through the lateral most extent of the incision. These should lie in the most dependent position of the dissection. The incisions are then closed with an absorbable stapler at the deep dermal plane, and then followed by an intradermal 2-0 absorbable barb suture. The nipple grafts are then thinned with the scissors, the peripheral areola is thinner than the central nipple in order to maintain projection. The nipple grafts are sutured onto the deepithelialized flaps with 5O fast absorbing gut. Four quilting sutures are then placed around the nipple with 5O fast absorbing gut. Surgical tape is placed along the incisions and a bolster dressing on the nipple grafts. This is secured with Tegaderm. A binder with compression foam is then placed on the chest high at the level of the axilla.
this is, I hope that short video highlighted some of the operative techniques. Uh, this is a very well tolerated operation with few complications. As I mentioned, I do use drains and I do think that a binder postoperatively for the first three weeks is helpful. Hematoma occurs in about five to 7% of cases. There are some hematomas which are large and need to be taken back to the operating room for evacuation to avoid compromise to the nipple, the skin flaps, and ultimate scar formation. There are other uh, small collections of blood or hematoma which can be milked out through the drain. Seroma, uh, I am quite aggressive with and do drain in the office with a 18 gauge needle. I think it's important to drain to avoid scar formation and capsule formation. Should scar form, physical therapy and Kenalog in injections as well as massage are really useful adjuncts. Nipple hypopigmentation does occur in some darker skin patients. Pigment often returns over time, and so I wait nine months to a year and then uh, offer a tattoo. Nipple loss is incredibly uncommon, but the risk is increased with hematoma and in smokers. I do cotinine test all of my patients preoperatively. This is an individual who smoked and had a hematoma. The nipple was reconstructed with a three-dimensional tattoo. This is a uh, diagram that a patient brought um, demonstrating all the things that they did not like. Um, and I have to agree with their assessment. The, I prefer that the incisions are straight across the pec shadow and then angle up rather than being curvy. Um, the, I do remove all the breast tissue and uh, try to achieve a very flat contour. I do resize the nipples so that they're not too large and try to keep them in the lower lateral aspect of the pectoralis muscle. Um, I avoid U-shaped incisions, which can be feminizing. And so here are some ways um, to avoid the things that were seen in the previous slide. Um, I do place the incision in the pectoral shadow, not in the inframammary fold. I follow the pec shadow up laterally rather than coming straight across. I'm careful to obliterate the IMF and all of its attachments. I remove all the breast tissue and do not use it to contour the chest at all. The chest should be flat. I address the axillary roll in the lateral chest wall at the time of the initial surgery. I do this with direct excision rather than liposuction. And I place the nipple in the lower lateral aspect of the pectoralis muscle using the delta pectoral groove uh, as one of my guides. And as I mentioned, I resize the areola to 2.2 centimeters. This is an example of an individual where the um, incision does highlight the pec shadow, um, both medially and then curving up laterally. This is an example of a patient where I think I placed the incision too high, slightly missing the pec shadow, and then continued out straight rather than curving up laterally. This is an intraoperative um, photograph, which was highlighted in the video demonstrating that the inframammary fold is actually below the pectoralis muscle shadow. And I continue on, I dissect beyond the IMF to obliterate this crease. I then sit the patient up and I'm careful to make sure that the lines are straight medially and then curve up laterally. Again, removing all of the breast tissue uh, and making sure, following the plane between the subcutaneous um, fat and the breast parenchyma to a, get a nice flat contour. I avoid using any kind of um, breast tissue to contour the chest. And I think that this is possible even in a patient with a higher BMI. There's the concern that you'll that they'll have a concave chest if you don't leave breast tissue behind. But I think that it's important to remember that breast tissue needs to be surveyed and it can be subject to changes in weight, hormones, and age. The axillary fold and the lateral chest wall can be tricky areas. I use direct excision and, move, and I've moved away from liposuction of these areas because I think that liposuction at the time of the initial operation can increase seroma and hematoma. Again, I still think it's possible to use direct excision even in the patient with a slightly higher BMI. Many patients will ask that their incisions not meet in the middle. This is a discussion that you'll need to have with patients ahead of time. 
particularly when the breast tissue meets preoperatively in the middle. And in order to avoid the central dog ear, the incisions may need to meet. I prefer a slight V or upward turn to highlight the turn of the pec medially. Areola sizing, I use a 2.2 centimeter um, nipple areolar cookie cutter. And I make my marks with the patient in the seated position and the arms at the side. I then lay the patient back down and I put the arms back out to 90 degrees. And as you can see, the shape of the marked nipple changes slightly. And I then remark this before cutting. There are some nipples which are slightly larger and do need reduction. I find that the wedge reduction works well when the uh, stalk of the nipple is larger than 11 to 12 centimeters and wider than five millimeters. For nipples that are exceptionally long, so longer than uh, 15 millimeters, I think that a composite graft works best. So you take an areolar graft as well as a nipple graft. You inset the areolar graft. I use an eight millimeter punch centrally and then inset the areolar, uh, rather the nipple graft. Nipple stretch with a periareolar uh, concentric circle is an issue and I'm sorry that some of these are blurred. Um, and for that reason, I have moved towards the inferior crescent. Um, discussing with the patient that if the areola doesn't shrink down adequately, and it often does, you can go back at nine months or even a year and reduce the size of the areola. This is an example of a patient where I think I selected the wrong technique. So this was a 2B patient and the patient did wanna try for a periareolar. But it was an older patient, the distance from the nipple to the fold is longer, more than seven centimeters, and there was significant skin laxity. So then areola stretched, I was left with extra skin um, inferior to the nipple. I did go back and do a second concentric circle excision, but I think the nipples are still slightly low and off the pack. There are many patients who've had prior breast reduction, and certainly this is not a contraindication to chest surgery, and you can ha still have a wonderful re result. It's important to discuss with the patient that depending on the pattern that was used for the first surgery, the reduction surgery, it may not be possible to get out all of the scars in the initial operation. So thank you very much for joining and listening, and I'm looking forward to having a great discussion and hearing your questions. Great, thanks so much, Dr. Bubenlinger, for the presentation. Um, we're gonna get into uh, the Q&A in just one second. Um, a quick reminder, uh, we have a couple slides, but I'll just go over it. Um, all of these, uh, of today's Q&A and today's lecture, as well as all the prior uh, past Grand Rounds lectures are available on uh, peerastroom.com and peerastroomglobalopen.com. Uh, and for the Q&A, uh, we already got some questions and we'll start going through them. But again, uh, if you can just shorten them because we're gonna try and fit them on the screen in, can't, in case you can't hear me, that way everyone can see them as well as hear them. Um, so while uh, we are getting the Q&A portion set up, I'll just go ahead and start. Um, Dr. Bluvon, in these patients, I guess, specific with the double incision procedure, how are you counseling them on breast cancer risk uh, after the mastectomy um, and and kind of monitoring um, for chest wall cancers uh, moving forward because a lot of them are very young. Yeah, certainly this is an issue. Um, the We give the same instruction that we would to a cisgender individual who's had a mastectomy and that is that you should do clinical monitoring and yearly exams, but there is no need for additional radiographic imaging unless you were to identify a concerning lump or mass. Great, thanks so much. So we've got uh, a bunch of questions. Uh, we'll try and get through as many um, of these. The first one's from Nelson Rodriguez. A little bit of this got cut off. So again, please shorten your questions as much as you can. But uh, uh, he's asking, is there a role, a uh, good question, for incisional negative pressure wound therapy for your closures? Um, certainly, it's not something that I have used um, in this particular incision. I think it's great for abdominoplasty or paniculectomy. Um, this incision heals quite well. Um, 
especially because you're in a binder, you're in compression, and patients are really um, quite good about limiting their arm movement in the early period. So uh, the bol- we haven't had an issue with um, using bolsters, just zero form bolsters to get our nipple grafts to take. Uh, certainly something you could consider, but it there is a slightly added cost and then making sure that it doesn't alarm when the patient goes home, but certainly something um, that's worthwhile exploring. Great. So our next question um, is going to be from uh, uh, Marillo. Uh, I don't know if we can get this up, but uh, it's a good one. So how do you uh, approach pa- uh, these patients that have had breast dogs previously? Have you ever run into that or have any tips for that? Yes, actually. So the patient that I showed you um, where there was nipple loss was a prior smoker um, or was an active smoker, had a hematoma. He also had had a prior breast augmentation. You can see um, a slight highlight or suggestion of his prior scar. Um, Obviously, the implants were removed prior to the surgery. um, And the, we approached it just as you would a grade three or a grade four, so a double incision free nipple graft. Great. Our next question um, is from Samid Bustos. Uh, what are other surgical considerations when taking the cat when considering transmale top surgery uh, in patients under 18? So basically, what are you, are you doing anything differently uh, maybe even from the pre-op and intra-op standpoint when you're looking at younger patients? So as I said, I think this can be an incredibly effective um, and rewarding operation, uh, life-changing and life-saving. Um, it's important to remember that um, chest masculinization treats gender dysphoria, and it there may still be other issues that are common in adolescents that are not treated by surgery. Um, you do want to make sure that patients have a adequate support network, that they fully understand um, the recovery process, uh, what things will look like. Um, but again, uh, I, many adolescents, this is life-changing intervention. Uh, all right, these are all coming in now. So we have uh, Samarth uh, Gupta next, and I pro- apologize for all my pronunciations. Um, how uh, do you prevent uh, puckering specifically for incisions uh, involving the areola? I guess we can talk about peris too as well. Yeah, so I think that this is where you can wind up with, again, I use the concentric circle or the um, inferior crescent. And I think what you're referring to is when you have to do a large concentric circle. And I usually limit it to, um, no more than a centimeter and a half of um, skin that I'm excising or deepithelializing. Um, the puckering often settles out, but you may have stretch of the areola, or if the um, scar is at all hypertrophic or even pigmented, the halo of the scar can make the areola look larger. So something to talk to patients about. So we have Erica Lee uh, asking, do you find differences in patient satisfaction in those with uh, preserved nipple sensation, um, maybe even with the lower ellipse excisions or when you're doing uh, the free nipple grafts? Um, So I have a discussion with patients ahead of time, regardless of the technique that's used, that I can't guarantee nipple sensation. The nerves obviously come from the lateral uh, chest wall. They travel through the fascia. They penetrate the breast tissue and continue up through the nipple. Um, And so with a periareolar or a double incision free nipple graft, you're still, you're cutting those nerves. Now, when you lay it back down, there may be some re innervation I think there are very few studies which look carefully and scientifically at outcomes regarding sensation. So it's very much patient reported and that's not to minimize it, but it, um, there isn't too poor discrimination or differentiation. It's just patient reports sensation. Um, so patients do report sensation even that comes back over time at a year, um, even with a double incision free nipple graft. But the quality of that sensation it's generally just tactile. If it's pressure or temperature, it's not erogenous generally. Um, so I th- I'm always careful to talk to patients about that, that I cannot guarantee sensation. There are patients who report it, um, but it's variable across the board. 
Great. And uh, Samita has another good question. Um, what is your technique for reducing nipple size when they're very large? Um, maybe even, I guess, areola size in, in the peris too. Right. So um, I think there are two techniques that you can use. There's, um, you can obviously, the straightforward when the stalk of the nipple is less than 11 millimeters and narrower than five millimeters, I take it as a straight graft. The next is that slightly longer, slightly wider nipple where you'd like to reduce it. And for those, I take a wedge. There's then the very large nipple uh, that has a long stalk. And for those, I do a composite graft. So I take the uh, areolar graft and I take a composite about eight millimeter to one centimeter graft of nipple. I inset the areolar graft I punch out the center with an eight millimeter punch and I inset the nipple graft. Great, oh, um, from plastic and reconstructive surgery. Um, the journal would like to know for thin patients, are there ever concerns with scarring of the skin uh, to the pectoralis muscle, giving you somewhat of the uh, animation deformity you might see with implants? Um, so you can certainly have tethering and I have seen this in the perior Realer, um, where so it's generally not an issue in a double incision. It can be an issue where the nipple um, almost hangs over in a peri. Um, there are a couple of ways to approach that. One is massage. So if you catch this early, you can massage, inject with Kenalog if that's what's tethering um, at that point. Um, if it still does not resolve after nine months to a year, you may have to go back in through that incision. Um, and release and then redrape the lower pole of the uh, periareolar. Um, our next uh, question, I think, is from Jorge. Uh, how about uh, nipple reconstruction? Actually, I think we, we talked about this one. Um, we I think you went over nipple reconstruction a good amount. So maybe we'll just go down one more uh, to Lindsay James uh, and. and uh, she's asking, I said, thank you for a great lecture. Do you routinely use laser to help with scarring? So I guess maybe just going over scar treatment in general for these double incisions. So lasers are amazing if you have access to them. Obviously, this is not that's not covered by insurance. And so that's an added expense that many patients can't afford. So what we um, we use um, silicone sheeting very early on, and we tell patients to use that starting at about two to three weeks. And then we're aggressive with scar massage, scar care, and sunscreen. Um, certainly lasers and even tattooing of scars are wonderful if you have access to that and that's within your budget. Great. Uh, Raj uh, Parikh is asking us, uh, do patients ever desire increased contour of the check uh, of the chest or pec uh, postoperatively, so more bulk to get some more, more superior masculine appearance? Yeah, certainly, um, it's not a common question. Um, and as I said, I am careful not to use breast tissue to contour the pec because it can be unpredictable. Its response to age, changes in hormone levels, uh, weight can be unpredictable, and then it also needs to be monitored. Um, we have had patients who, after chest surgery, feel much more confident uh, working out and building their pec muscles. Um, I was fortunate enough, and I trained with Beverly Fisher, who did um, injections into the pec muscle of fat uh, later on, um, but the long-term results were um, not lasting, and so it didn't add long-term bulk. I think definitely the best way to um, increase bulk is through weightlifting and pec exercises. Uh, Clarky Hussey asks, um, I'll just abbreviate this one. So it's basically asking about uh, testosterone. So um, have you maybe changed your approach at all to that? And do you think there are effects to taking testosterone, stopping it? And does that affect outcomes from maybe what you've seen? Um, so we have had patients who've gone on to carry, um, to carry a pregnancy to term. Um, if I have seen, these have not been my own patients, but they've come back. And if um, any breast tissue was left behind in the initial operation, occasionally it 
hypertrophies in response to the um, hormone surges that occur in pregnancy and has to be excised. Um, with regard to changes in the quality of the skin and the texture of the skin, it's not something that I have seen or appreciated. Um, we've seen patients who have never bound, have bound for years, patients who have never been on testosterone, patients who have been on testosterone for years, patients who have surgery and then start testosterone afterwards. And so um, I think that that is not a factor that's directly affected the results. Great. And then uh, Aksa Azura is asking for patients uh, with larger chests, uh, why is the double incision preferred uh, over the peri? Um, so maybe just summarizing the algorithm again um, for some of the patients, larger patients. Right. So in a larger chest um, with a perireolar, I'm unable to um, get out enough skin to create a flat chest. And I think there was that one slide where I showed you, they didn't even, the individual didn't really even have that much breast tissue. And it didn't appear that they had a tremendous amount of skin laxity, but you saw that even with a concentric circle, I was not successful in the first go round at getting out all of that tissue. Um, in my hands, I find that the, the T incision cones the breast and cones the chest. So I can get a flatter contour with a double incision as opposed to a T or an anchor incision. Great, thank you. So uh, Will Rifkin uh, is asking, do you have any specific techniques for patients with an intermediate amount of breast tissue? So too much, so kind of maybe that, that gray zone, are you modifying anything? Yes. Uh, great question. Um, there are patients where the nipple position is ideal. So it's right in the corner of the pec, um, above the pec shadow. Um, and it's really tempting to do a periorealer, but the distance between the nipple and the fold is longer than seven centimeters. And the, it's almost as if you have pseudotosis. So a significant amount of the breast tissue is lying below the um, nipple areolar complex. And in these individuals, you can do an ellipse and the incision still follows the pec shadow, but you're not um, taking the nipple off and putting and using it as a free act. You're leaving it in place and placing the incision below uh, the nipple. Okay, uh, Jane is uh, asking us, what kind of activity limitations do you require postoperatively? So what's your post-op protocol? So the binder is in place for about three weeks, um, no heavy lifting. So nothing more than um, 10 pounds for the first six weeks. Um, patients generally limit their own arm movement, but um, slowly increase their range of motion and their arm movement over the first six weeks. And by about six weeks, they're back to usual activity. Um, so Hakur is asking any uh, specific moder modifications or uh, considerations for the Asian patient or maybe any patients of different ethnicities, skin tones, do you change anything up? Um, so I think um, in Asian patients, you do have to be very careful about hypertrophic scarring. Um, and so in a periorealer, that's the individual that you really want to use if you can, the inferior crescent, and come back in a delayed fashion and then do um, a concentric circle if you need to with a reduction. Because even the scar itself, although the areola is the correct size and hasn't stretched, if the scar is dark or hypertrophic, uh, it can make the areola appear larger than it is. Um, Will has another good question. Uh, BMI cutoff, so preoperative indications, contraindications. Um, so obviously we encourage patients, um, every hospital and every anesthesiologist is going to have a different um, BMI cutoff if you're working um, in a hospital versus in a surgery center. Um, the, I think it's important that patients with a higher BMI be counseled in the higher rate um, of seroma formation and the higher need for revision, particularly of the lateral chest wall. It can be very difficult to get out all of the tissue in the first round. Um, the good news is it's very difficult to exercise with a binder and with extra tissue on your chest that you don't feel comfortable with. And so um, patients um, are often quite successful with exercise, weight loss, and then we um, go back and revise. So I think in patients with a higher BMI, it's important to talk about the drains being in for a longer, um, the higher rate of needing a revision, particularly the lateral chest wall. 
Great. So um, Sebastian Torres has a question. I think there was something similar again uh, by uh, Nelson Rodriguez. So the role of liposuction, you touched upon this briefly, whether it is ultrasound or just uh, mm -hmm. regular lipo. Right. So I used to use liposuction, particularly for the axillary fold and the lateral chest wall. Um, I did think that I, it increased my rate of hematoma and seroma. So I prefer to directly excise these areas. Um, you can see them well. You can still see the plane, thin the flap laterally and uh, thin the um, flap in the axillary fold. Uh, you can, I then, if it's unsuccessful, uh, go back and secondarily lipo, but I have not had to do that actually when I really focus on those areas. Uh, another good question from Jane. Uh, I have noticed widening of the scars. So um, tips, tricks to prevent uh, widening of these uh, double incision scars. Yeah, I think that um, I, I certainly agree with you, Jane. I've seen it on the um, lateral aspect. And so again, making sure um, that's where I see it most. And it's probably from patients moving their arms. Um, so we do, we don't tell them to, some, some people will tell them to hold their arms a T-Rex position. I think you want to be careful not to limit people's mobility long-term with the frozen shoulder or arm. And so we do want you moving, but being mindful of moving using scar strips, um, which can also support the scar as it heals. And then you do want, um, if you're finding that it's happening in the medial portion of the um, incision, it may be that there's um, a little too much tension on the scar. But certainly laterally, this is an issue um, that we see more commonly even when there's minimal tension. Um, great. I think we have time maybe for like uh, one or two more. Um, Nikita asks, and you mentioned this, uh, about tobacco use. Um, it's been shown to be highly comorbid with certain, with gender dysphoria. So, uh, and you had shown some pictures about this. How are you counseling patients? Um, and maybe you could mention, you know, the issues mm -hmm. with that again. Yeah, so um, we, if a patient is smoking, vaping, using any nicotine products, we counsel them on the need to stop smoking. And we do test um, ahead of time, uh, a month in advance to give them the opportunity to stop um, smoking. Um, we work or we ask them to work with their primary care provider um, to use Welbutrin, uh, Chantix. And although the rate of uh, returning to tobacco use after surgery um, is higher in those who smoke, um, we have found that patients have been incredibly successful and determined in quitting for the perioperative period. So um, four weeks ahead and at minimum of four weeks after surgery. Great, thank you. I think for our final question, we've got uh, Mr. Carter Boyd uh, coming in uh, with your biggest piece of advice for those starting to offer and build um, a gender affirming mastectomy practice and getting started with these procedures. Yeah, I think um, this, in, at least in um, my opinion, um, certainly it's what I've dedicated my practice, but I find um, the opportunity to improve somebody's quality of life um, and change uh, their life. This is truly a life-saving operation for many, uh, incredibly rewarding, and that's why we went into it in plastic surgery. I think as you start out, um, really carefully studying your results. So looking at your post-operative photographs and thinking, what could I have done a little bit differently? How could I have improved um, that result? Um, and I think that um, patients share their results um, with their friends on um, the internet. And I think if you approach the procedure um, with the same care and deliver excellent results, you will build a reputation um, and people will come to you. Great, thank you so much. So I think um, with that, uh, we're gonna wrap up uh, our night. Thank you everyone uh, for tuning in for all the great questions. Remember um, that you can tune back into these and all the other uh, PRS Grand Rounds um, on the journal's website. A uh, special thanks to Dr. Rorick, to Aaron, Maddie, the rest of the PRS editorial team for uh, putting this together. And of course, for Dr. Bluban Langner uh, for sharing her expertise tonight. Thanks very much. And we'll see you for the next one. Thank you for having me.